We have been in a series over the last couple of weeks. And uh, again, if this is your first time with us, welcome. And I hope you'll go back. You can go online and watch the different messages that we've done. But in this series that we've been talking about, we've been talking about God is. We've been talking about God as a healer. We've been talking about God is here. We talked about God is listening, God is just. We talked about all these different elements of God. But the point that we really wanted you to grasp was not to just be able to know the different things of God, but to experience the different things with God. It's one thing to merely have head knowledge about something. It's another thing to be able to experience it. And so in this series, we've been challenging, we've been teaching what the Word of God says in these, these different areas, and, and we don't want you just to know the facts, we want you to experience the reality. So today, I want to give you another reality. I want to give you just another simple truth, and it, it would be this, is that Father wants you free. God wants you free. See, the, the, the beautiful thing is, is that the scripture tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It goes on and it says this, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. But that very first part just gives us the text that we're going to stand on today is simply this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You see, the, the, the Father wants us delivered from bondage of sin. He wants us delivered from addiction. He wants us delivered from all those things that hold us captive and hold us and restrain us back from being and doing everything that God has called us to do and be. Whether that be wounds from childhood, whether that be the offense that you still carry from that, from the marriage situation. No matter what it may be, the, the truth is, is that Jesus wants us to be able to be free. Now, I, I would ask this of the parents, grandparents. If you had a child that was in addiction to drugs, as a parent, you would so hurt and yearn for your child to be set free. If you were a parent and you, you, you had a child, maybe a married couple, uh, your children were married and they just kept finding themselves in, in financial bondage and debt and they just stayed in that and they fought with that all the time. As a parent, would you not want to see your kids learn what financial freedom really looks like? If you had a child who just walked in bitterness Maybe it's from a hurt, maybe it's from a wound, and, and please understand this, we're all going to have our hurts and wounds, all of us. We're all going to go through that, but there's a difference, and you need to know that there's no such thing as a servant without scars. If you've made a decision to follow Christ, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get wounded. Some of y'all may have said, well, Scott, that's why I came to Jesus, so I wouldn't get hurt anymore. Eh, wrong religion. Noah Webster, the guy that wrote the, wrote the dictionary, said this, if you want an easy religion, don't choose Christianity. We're going to get wounded, but I want you to understand something. That's why his name is Jehovah Rapha, God the healer. We are going to be hurt. We're going to be hurt in life. But there's this God that we can go to who brings about healing in those areas. And can I tell you this? Those scars that you will have, and that, that's what a scar is. A scar is a healed up wound. Some people think, well, Scott, you know that time heals all things. That's bull. That's, that's bull. Greek word, diklamas, Bull. Because you have an infection, just give it time. Then you'll have an amputation. Thank you. <laughs> the truth is this, we're, we're all going to go through wounds, but if we experience, if we experience, if we go to God, the healer, Jehovah Rapha, then he brings about a healing. And that scar, can I just go ahead and tell you this? That scar becomes a medallion, of, of, of a gold medallion for God's grace. That you could tell people when they say, oh, that, that horrible, that ugly thing that happened to you at work. And you can say, yeah, I took it to God. And can I tell you how it turned out for God's glory? Amen. If I read the scripture right, it says all things. Say all things. 
all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. In other words, it doesn't matter how bad it was, how ugly it was, God in his beauty and his grace, his power and his might says, I'll do something good with it if you'll let me. So we're going to have the scars. Thank you, Father God, that we don't have the wounds. But if you've got that child who is bitter, just angry at the world all the time, wouldn't you? When you want to see them set free, then if you and me, being jacked up people, know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more does our Father who's in heaven? Matthew chapter 7 verse 11 says exactly that. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him? If, if we want to see our children set free, how much more does God want to see us set free? And so the reality, the reality is this. As parents, we want freedom. God wants that freedom. See, what, what, is, what is bondage? Bondage is the things that hold us. It keeps us captive from moving in the fullness of what God has in store for you. That's why the scripture talks about in Hebrews chapter 12. If you're taking notes, just jot that down. But Hebrews chapter 12 says, therefore, let us throw off. Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Why is that in there? Because it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Jesus says, I don't want you walking in bondage. You, can, I, can I say this to you today? You don't have to walk in bondage. You don't have to walk in that entrapment. You don't have to walk continually in that bitterness and that hurt. You don't have to continually walk in those different things. Now, see, I want you to understand this. In John chapter 11, you're taking notes, jot it down. In John chapter 11, we read about uh, a man named Lazarus, right? We're not going there, so don't go there in your scripture. But we read about this man. He, he loved Jesus, and he died, and he was in the grave for four days. And Jesus comes up, and j- watch this. Jesus speaks life into death. He calls a man who is dead. He speaks his name. That man comes forward in life. Somebody should be getting excited here because that's your story. That is the salvation story. God called us by name. He didn't say, hey, Lake Country, I'm called. No, he didn't say, Fort Worth, it's now you. No, he looks at you, he calls you by name. Tim, David, Alex, he calls you by name. And he calls you from death to life. God is a life giver. But but stay with me. When he spoke the name Lazarus, and Lazarus came out of that tomb. Lazarus came out. I want you to see this because so many times we we get an image of Lazarus, right? We see Lazarus. He's coming out. Maybe he's got some kind of, you know, robe on or something. He's like, Jesus, Jesus. No, you got to keep in mind, Lazarus was mummified. He was wrapped in gauze, head to toe. I mean, he's like. It doesn't look near spiritual when you get that image, but that's what happened. Why? Because he was wrapped in grave clothes. And the very first thing that Jesus commanded when Lazarus came from death to life, keep in mind again, that's the picture of your salvation. Jesus called you by name and he called you from death to life. But when Lazarus came out, the very first thing Jesus said was, take off the grave clothes. Was Lazarus alive? Yeah. But he was wrapped in grave clothes. Can I ask you this real quick? Who are grave clothes made for? Was Lazarus dead? That's why Jesus said, take him off. Why? They're binding him. They're constricting him. He can't move the way I designed him to. He can't be a part of life. He can't embrace life to the fullness with those grave clothes wrapped around him. So God said, set him free. Take those things off of him. Uh, Jesus did not raise Lazarus from the dead so that Lazarus could walk in bondage. Somebody better grab that. 
Jesus didn't raise Lazarus from the dead so he could walk in bondage. Can I speak this with your name in it? Jesus didn't raise you from the dead so that you could walk in bondage. Are you with me on that? It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. The problem is, tell me if I'm missing this. There are still so many believers like Lazarus. You're alive in Christ. You're a new creation. You, you, he's called you from death to life, but you stand there with the grave clothes on. Are you a believer? Absolutely. He's called me from death to life. But I'm still in bondage. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So with that being the introduction, (laughs) will y'all take your scripture with me today? How many of y'all, you got your Bibles with you today? Hold those up, man. I love seeing that. It's one of my favorite parts of the morning. Uh, Oh, God, you look good this morning, guys. You look good. Those online, if you're driving, don't have to do this. Okay, good. But turn over, turn over our text today that I want to take us to as we talk about God is deliver. I want you to go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, we read the account of a man who was demon-possessed. We'll call him the demoniac. This man was in, in bondage. This man was trapped. And Jesus came to set him free. Can I tell you, he's still in that business. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Mark chapter 5, verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart, and he broke the irons with his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out, and he would cut himself with stones. You ever gone over to your grandmother's house to eat and she just laid the Thanksgiving feast in front of you, right? And it's not Thanksgiving. It's October 11th. But there's, it's just, she laid out the spread. You walk in going, oh, good heavens. That's exactly how I feel with this text right now. There, there, <laughs> there is so much in this text for us to talk about that I, I, I'm just probably going to go and be a little prophetic here and say I don't think we're going to knock this out all this week but I want to start so put on the napkins and grab a fork and knife we start we start with this simple part here they they went across to the region of garrisons now I got to hit this this is important what is Gerasenes? Gerasenes, this is not a Jewish area. You realize that Jesus was Jewish, right? You also realize that the scripture says that Jesus came first, salvation-wise, first for the Jews. The Jews were the children of God. These were God's chosen people. So there's they're, they're, they're a, they, a, a priority placed upon the Jewish people. This is not a Jewish territory. This is not a Jewish area whatsoever. Now, Jesus traveled here. For one reason, he had an appointment to set somebody free. Jesus, I just want you to see this. Jesus left where he was to get to this man, one man, so that he could set this man free. Can, can I say this to you today? In the same way that Jesus, in John chapter 4, the scripture says, and Jesus had to go to Samaria. Why did Jesus have to go to Samaria in John chapter 4? Because there was one woman there, a woman at the well. He had an appointment. Jesus was going after that woman in John chapter 4. Jesus was going after this demoniac in Mark chapter 5. Can I speak this to you? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you're living in bondage, can I tell you this? Jesus is coming after you. Jesus, and some of y'all, I hope y'all didn't get scared. Just went, oh, crap. 
You're right. I, 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 I bet he is. No, no, no. He's coming to love on you. He's coming to show you who he really is. And he's coming to bring you from death to life and to set you free. In the same way that Jesus left where he was to go to these people, Jesus is doing the same today, online, in this room live for you. I got good news for you. Jesus is coming after you. Jesus went there for that one agenda, and Jesus is coming today. This message today is because he's coming after you, and he wants you free. From that hurt, that wound, that bondage, that sin, whatever it is, Daddy wants to set you free. And he's coming after you. He's coming after me. As I said, this wasn't a Jewish territory. Let me just give you a quick, let me chase a quick rabbit. This is not a Jewish territory. Jesus came first for the Jews. But what we are seeing here in this text right here is a foreshadow of what is about to happen. The gospel message is about to come to the Gentiles. Jesus is just the point man. He's just the forerunner. He's, he's starting the party off because there's going to be a time, we read about that in the book of Acts, where the message gospel is going to come first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. We're already getting a taste of it here. I think it's also, I think it's also fair to say they're seeing Jesus come after a demoniac, a demon-possessed madman. We, we read about these accounts in Matthew, and we read about them in Luke. And the, and the scripture there talks about that this crazy man living among the tombs, he's cutting himself with pottery. He's running around this graveyard naked. God is going, yeah, I want them all. I don't want just churchgoers. I want them all. Jesus is coming here to bring salvation to the Jews. When Jesus got out of the boat, verse 2, when Jesus got out of the boat, an impure, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and he broke the irons with his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stone. This man was in torment. This man was in agony. This man was in bondage. Look at verse 5, what it says right there. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and he would cut himself with stones. You know, today we, we, we look at people who uh, in, in destruction and desperation, they will, they will cut themselves. Uh, the term cutters. And so many times I've talked to teenagers who said this is a new thing. I was like, no. Because it's the same enemy. It's an old enemy. And that's why the scripture says in John 10, 10 about Satan that the thief came to kill, steal, and destroy. Guess what? He didn't just start that in this generation. He's always been doing that. That's always been his game plan. And so we see this man in destruction, cutting himself, hurting himself. This man lived among the tombs. Ooh, we got to see that. There's something we need to see here. Talking about bondage. He lived among the tombs, real quick. In Jesus' time, where were tombs? Tombs were never in the city. Tombs were always isolated. They were outside of the city. They were away from everybody. Here's what I want you to be able to see. The enemy will isolate so that he can annihilate. See, t tell me if I'm missing this. What the enemy does, he whispers in our ear, believers. Can I talk to believers here real quick? He talks to believers and he says, believers, oh, I can't believe you're, you're dealing with that sin. That anger, that lust, that materialism, that gossip, that jealousy, whatever it is. The enemy will whisper in your ear and say, man, you're the only one. You're the only one. Man, look, look at all these believers inside of this church. I can't even believe you're here. You are because you, you have this sin in your life. You have this, this bondage in your life. I mean, there's all these people. They love Jesus, and they got their Bibles. They held them up. And even, even during the worship time, man, I, I don't know why all these people had questions, but, but, but that's not you. You're the only one struggling in this area. That is what the enemy does because the enemy wants to isolate so that he can annihilate. 
I don't know if y'all have ever seen it, but, but I, I, I love watching the different animal channels, right? Have you ever seen one of the cats attack a prey? Because what they do is they separate them from the herd. They want to get that animal and they want to separate it from everyone else so that they can jump on that one animal. They can devour it. They, they, they don't want to take it on in the entire herd. And that's probably why the scripture will tell us this in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. It says, be alert and sober mind your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I've actually been in Africa a handful of times, and I can remember sleeping in our tents, not a lodge, we had tents, and I can remember them telling us, hey, middle of the night, if you need to go to the restroom, there's a dug latrine over here, but you need to make sure you take a light and shine it all around, because there's lions. And I was like, my prayer life just went up. <laughs> and I can remember, I can literally remember laying in that tent at night going, there really are lions here. What's going to keep that lion from eating me? Oh, I've got a zipper right there on the tent. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, I don't know, 2 a.m. or something, all of a sudden, I heard that roar release. <gasps> I got right with God right there. I'm just telling you. Whole, yeah. But can I tell you something? The reason the lion does that. The scripture is so accurate. Who would have thought scripture being accurate? But the scripture is so accurate. Because it says that your enemy like a roaring lion. Do you know why the male lion roars? It's to separate the herd. He scares out the animals. When he lets loose of that roar, he scares those animals so they separate and they're not together. He wants to isolate so that he can annihilate. But can I tell you what the church, can I tell you, and when I say church, I don't mean just kind of the big religious system. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about believers coming together and doing real life together. Can I tell you what that should more look like? See, God has not created any of us to walk alone. He's created us to be a body. He's created us to be even a family of God. And we talk about animals that are being attacked. Have you ever seen muskox? All right, some of you are going, uh, no. Let me tell you what musk ox do. When their predator comes at them, they know that the enemy wants to isolate, to annihilate. So what musk ox will do is they will back up to each other. And they'll create a circle so that they are able to take on as a group. They're able to take on the enemy. And the enemy knows this. And that's why he tries to isolate people. Can I tell you, those that are home, listen, we're glad you're at home. We are so glad we got the technology to be able to come into your home and do this. But can I tell you, do not make this a way of life. Do not make, well, Scott, I can just worship Jesus at my home, can I? Yes, and I hope you do. But can I tell you, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing is what Hebrews tells us. We need to be a part of the body of Christ together because the enemy wants to uh, isolate you. He wants you to just be, hey, it's good enough to just worship Jesus at home by myself. No, you need the body of Christ. And can I tell you this also in love? We need you. Ecclesiastes, man, makes it so clear. I love this passage. Two are better than one, for they have a good return for their work. If either of them falls down, one of them can help him up. But pity the man who has no one to help him up. Also, if one falls down, also if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strand is not quickly broken. Can I give you another just real quick passage? Proverbs 27, 17 simply says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Ladies, can I challenge you on something? Be a part of this women's Bible study. 
You, you t- t- tell me if I'm missing this, ladies. How many of you have said, man, God, I just need godly friends. I just need to be around some godly women. Jesus, oh, th- here's your sign. As iron sharpens iron, so one woman sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Again, I just want you to see this. The enemy wants to isolate so that he can annihilate. God is saying, I'm calling you together as the family of God. It requires us working together. So, what I also want you to be able to see is this. Inside that passage, we saw where it said that there were people that came up to the demoniac, right? They came up to the demoniac, and they tried to chain him. They tried to chain his feet. They tried to chain his hands. Because here was this madman, naked, hanging out, running through the tombs, cutting himself. They're sitting here. At some point, I'm sure there was empathy. I'm sure there was concern for the man. And so people came, and they tried to subdue him so he wouldn't hurt himself. It's another point. I'm sure it was, look, we just don't want you to hurt us anymore. And so they tried to chain him. They tried to control him. And the Scripture says he broke the chains. Here's what I want you to see. There is a certain freedom that only God can give. We can try to do this. Somebody, ah, he's, he's got mental disorder, and so we need to just, listen, I know there's mental disorder. I know there's chemical imbalances, but I'm telling you there's also freedom. There is a God who brings about freedom. I'm so excited that, that here at Lake Country, we, we, we've got our Celebrate Recovery class that meets here for people who have been in bondage, and, and many who still are, but they want to walk in freedom, and it's that process. We want to see them because they gravitate, listen to me, they gravitate to God because there's a freedom that only God can give. I believe that even today God wants to give that kind of freedom. When he, talking about the demon, verse 6, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. (laughs) Can I tell you something real quick? You don't have to introduce Jesus to your demons. They already know who Jesus is. In fact, the book of James says this. book of James in 2.19 says, even the demons believe that and they shudder. Even the demons believe that and they, can can I hit this just real quick? There's a lot of people saying, well, I believe. I hear that all the time. Especially I'm talking to somebody, so Scott, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. I believe. Right? That's like, in other words, leave me alone. (laughs) Don't invite me to your church. I believe. Well, Can I give you this reality? The the Bible says in James that even the devil believes. Even demons believe. And we'll talk about this another time, but there is a faith that does not lead to salvation. Another time. Then Jesus asked him, verse 9, then Jesus asked him, what's your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. All right, you're taking notes, man. I got some stuff for you here. First off, what did he say his name was? His name was Legion. What is Legion? Legion is a battalion of Roman soldiers. How many does it consist of? Depending on which author, historian you talk to, it's somewhere between four to 6,000. So this man is saying, my name is Legion. Legion meaning there are four to six thousand. Now I, I'm going to hit this real quick because I want I want to spread all truth to us when we study the Word of God. That does not necessarily mean that there was four to six thousand demons in the man. I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm just saying the devil's a liar. When he lies, he speaks his native language. So when he said, my name is Legion, that just could have been a name of intimidation that the enemy uses. Because can I tell you this? Like a lion, he uses intimidation. He uses fear. And so the enemy right there, he says, my name is Legion. Doesn't necessarily mean there were four to 6,000. May have been. But I I will jump on this. 
I believe there were at least 2,000 demons there. At least 2,000. And the reason why is because there was at least 2,000 pigs there that day. They're going to all commit suicide here in a second. Spoiler alert. So we're going to see 2,000 pigs self-destruct. Move on. It shows us that the demons also, I want you to see this. What was the demon begging? Don't send me out. But not just don't send me out. Don't send me out of this territory. Can, can I say this real quick? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. The demonic, there are regions. There are regions in the demonic. And I will tell you this. When the demonic get into a certain area, they want to stay. They want to set up shop and they want to stay. Whether that be over a providence. Can I bring it home now? Or an individual. Can I tell you something in pure love today? The enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to get a foothold in your life, in whatever area, so that he can ultimately get a stronghold. Anybody that's trapped in alcoholism, it started with a foothold. And it began to work its way. And in the same way, what the enemy wants to do is he wants to get an area, stay with me, he wants to get an area of your life and he wants to keep it. He wants to stay in that area of our lives. You remember the passage that we read about in the book of Matthew? Matthew talked about that when a, a demon, an evil spirit is cast out of a house, he goes out, but then he returns, and when he finds that the house is empty, he brings seven more spirits just as deadly as him back to the house. What was the problem in that account? The demons, the, 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 demons, the demonic, the, uh, whatever the issues were, were cast out. They were dealt with, but they, the house wasn't filled with Jesus. Somebody just real quick, you need to hear this. You get that demonic, you get that, the, uh, whatever it is that's holding you bound, tied, you get that out of your life, you need to replace it with God. You're sitting here going, well, man, Scott, I used to spend all this time, man, just, just looking at stuff on the computer I didn't need to be looking at, and I got that out of my life. Praise God. Praise God. But can I say something to you real quick? You better feel it. You better fill it. That time that you were using, man, filling it with the demonic, you better start filling it with the things of God because the enemy will come back. And if he finds that house is still empty, he'll fill it. The enemy wants a foothold so that he can get a stronghold. And if the enemy has you in fear or in materialism, or in hatred or bitterness or destructive habits. He wants to move from a foothold to a stronghold. Verse 11. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. Real quick. Reason number two that we know that this is, a, is not a Jewish area. We got pigs. Simple. Jews and pigs don't mix. I say this to Linda all the time. I'd make a horrible Jew. <laughs> Love my pork chops. This is how we also know this is not a Jewish area. They're pigs. They're on the hillside. So I want you to get it. Just can I give this to you real quick? I want you to get an image. Here's this graveyard. Here's these tombs. Demoniac crazy man's running around cutting himself. And just right over here is a hillside, and on the hillside, pigs are, are you know, the, the farmers, ranchers, pig herders, pig herders, there it is. Pig herders are with those pigs. They're watching everything that's taking place here. They see Jesus' boat pull up with the disciples inside of it. They see the disciples getting out of the boat, and all of a sudden, they see pop up, man. There's the demoniac. He pops up. Why? Because something inside of him got disturbed. Can I, let me throw this to you. There are some people, there are some people in your life that don't like being around you. 
because you disturb their demons. Can I give you that? There are some people that when you get near them, the Holy Spirit that's inside of you disrupts what's inside of them. They don't like your lifestyle. They can't understand it. They don't understand why you believe in a God you can't see. You talk to a God that, that, that you can't hear audibly. There's something inside of them that's disturbed because of what's inside of you. And when Jesus pulled up inside of that boat, whoa, those demons got disturbed. They popped up. Just like my children when I say, who wants ice cream? Bah! Heads pop up. That demon, they popped up, and he starts beelining it straight to him and however many thousand demons beelining it straight over to Jesus. And you know those pig herders are on the hillside, and they're watching this whole thing. They're watching this whole thing. They see the boat, and they're like, oh, 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 oh dude, y'all don't want to do Ah, crazy Bob, there he is. And they're watching all this take place, and instead of the people freaking out, they took authority. Instead of them being scared, they walked. They knew their identity. And they stood their ground. They're watching all this take place. A large herd of pigs feeding nearby hillside. The demons begged, Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. We are talking about demon-possessed pigs. Is anybody catching this? Because this is kind of humorous to me. This is the first account we ever get of devil ham. Okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> they want to go inside of the pigs. Why? A, they want to stay in the territory. B, they still need a host. They move from, because they know Jesus, is, Jesus has made this man. He's created this man. They know that Jesus has not come to take a vote. Jesus has come to take authority. And Jesus walks up, and demons already know what's about to happen. They're begging this. Man, don't send us to the abyss. The abyss, a whole other demonology study we'll talk about another time. But what they're saying is we want to stay in this territory. Even if we have to downgrade big time from this mansion, man, ugh, to the nasty apartments, we'll do it. We want to stay here. And Jesus, th verse 13, he gave him permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000. 2,000 in number, they rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. You see, again, I'm going to tell you, listen to me. The nature of the demonic is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what John 10.10 10 is going to tell us. For some of us, even in bitterness... You're not living the full life that God has in store for you. If you're living in bondage to certain sins, to any sin, you're not living everything that God has in store for you. And what Jesus did, Jesus came to a man that was trapped. He came. He found him. And maybe you're here today and saying, Scott, I have tried to get freedom. Can I tell you something? Daddy didn't bring you here today to hear this message by accident. He wants you free. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Today in this passage, what we see is we see Jesus coming after the man. And he sets the man free. But there's more to this account that is so practical about walking in freedom. And I want to share that with you next week. So Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we do come to you today.